Hello, this is the review of the 2020 guidelines for the acute treatment of cerebral edema in neurocritical care patient. My name is Helen Pham, a PharmD candidate here at Navisense Health. The objectives for this presentation include defining the cerebral edema and discussing its clinical presentation, as well as reviewing the current guidelines for the acute treatment of cerebral edema, and then we'll go into the pharmacotherapies that the guidelines recommend. Cerebral edema is defined as an abnormal accumulations of fluid in the brain cells and or extracellular spaces of the brain. It's typically due to consequences of neurological injuries. Clinical presentation of cerebral edema may present bradycardia, hypertension, severe headache, irritability, visual disturbance, nausea and vomiting, and others that I've listed here. It can also be asymptomatic. As for the treatment and management of cerebral edema, we want to identify and treat it as early as possible to prevent herniation, permanent brain injury, and even death. Here I've listed non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatment. Under the non-pharmacological, we have craniectomy, head of bed elevation, as well as hyperventilation. Pharmacological, we have osmotherapy, volume resuscitation, corticosteroids, and diuretics. Before we head into the guidelines, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we treat cerebral edema before. So treatment of cerebral edema has been discussed in guidelines, including management of acute ischemic stroke, ischemic cerebral hemorrhage, and traumatic brain injury. However, within these guidelines, the recommendations aren't clear on the selection and monitoring parameters for the specific agent in order to optimize efficacy and safety. So in our 2020 guideline for acute treatment of cerebral edema, it will evaluate the recommended therapies, including mannitol, hypertonic saline, corticosteroids, as well as selected non-pharmacologic therapies. The guideline is separated based on the primary pathology of cerebral edema. So we'll go ahead and go through each disease state and then talk about the pharmacotherapy recommended for each in the guideline. The first one is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Hypertonic saline is recommended, may be recommended for the use of treatment and management of cerebral edema. There are two different dosing methods, including target-based dosing and symptom-based bolus dosing. In target-based dosing, the studies reported sodium levels of 145 to 155, and then for symptom-based bolus dosing, there were various dosing strategies, um, including various concentration of sodium chloride, including 23.4% as well as 7.2%. Hypertonic saline, however, has not shown improvement in neurological outcome, and this will come up again and again throughout the guidelines. Um, for subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, however, mannitol is not even mentioned. Next, we have traumatic brain injury. Hypertonic saline is recommended over mannitol for the management of elevated ICP as well as cerebral edema. Hypertonic saline has a quicker onset as well as greater level of ICP reduction and has been shown to work in those who failed mannitol. However, mannitol is a safe and effective alternative. It's actually preferred in patients with hyperneutremia as well as volume overload. Neither agent is expected to improve neurological outcomes, especially in the pre-hospital setting, because there are no benefits for the patient in the long term. In patients with acute ischemic stroke, hypertonic saline or mannitol may be recommended for management and treatment of elevated ICP or cerebral edema. We want to avoid prophylactic scheduled mannitol due to the increased risk of worsening of neurological outcomes. For hypertonic saline, continuous infusion to target sodium levels have shown inconsistent results. Neither data or neither agents have shown improvement in intracranial pressure, cerebral edema, or neurological outcomes. In intracranial hemorrhage patients, hypertonic saline is recommended over mannitol. Although they're both equal in safety and effectiveness, Two recent publications have shown potential risk of hematoma expansion with the administration of mannitol. Hypertonic saline can be given with either the symptom-based bolus dosing or the target sodium concentration. Corticosteroid was also mentioned under intracranial hemorrhage. It's actually recommended against the use of corticosteroids to improve neurological outcomes in these patients due to the fact that it can potentially increase risk in mortality as well as infectious complications. 
Next, we have bacterial meningitis. Hypertonic saline and mannosol may be used, but there is insufficient evidence to determine whether one or the other is preferred. Corticosteroid does have a role in bacterial meningitis. For community-acquired bacterial meningitis, dexamethasone 10 mg IV every six hours for four days, or if you have low body weight or high risk of corticosteroid side effects, then you can administer dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kg IV every six hours for four days. Tuberculosis meningitis, there are no specific recommendations on which corticosteroid or dose to use, but if a corticosteroid were to be used, then it can increase mortality and treatment may be continued for two or more weeks. For corticosteroids and bacterial meningitis, we want to administer it before or with the first dose of the antibiotic. Finally, we have hepatic encephalopathy. So either hypertonic saline or mannitol may be recommended in managing intracranial pressure or cereal edema. However, due to insufficient evidence, it's hard to determine which agent to use over the other. For a non-pharmacological treatment for cerebral edema, you may elevate the head of the bed to about 30 degrees, but no more than 45 degrees. This may be beneficial adjunct to reduce elevated ICP. You can also use cerebral spinal fluid diversion, which is removing fluid from the brain, and this may be beneficial adjunct to reduce ICP as well. And then there are brief episodes of hyperventilations that have been shown to decrease acute elevations of ICP. Osmotic therapies have been used for quite some time to treat brain injuries. Osmotic therapies work by drawing fluid out of the brain by creating an osmotic gradient. This entails decreased intracranial pressure as well as blood viscosity to also increase cerebral brain fluid and prevent further brain injuries. The ideal osmotic therapy agents are to produce favorable osmotic gradient as well as having minimal systemic side effects and being non-toxic. Agents such as mannitol or hypertonic saline that we have seen in the guideline. First, start with mannitol. Mannitol is a sugar alcohol that has been used to reduce intracranial pressure or cerebral edema since the 1960s. It's supplied in 5% to 25%. Adverse effects may include pulmonary congestion, electrolyte abnormality, acidosis, dehydration, hypotension, and headache. Contraindications to administering mannitol includes established anuria due to severe kidney issues, pulmonary congestion, active internal bleeding, severe dehydration, or hypersensitivity. When administering mannitol, it has an onset within 10 to 20 minutes. The duration of action is 4 to 6 hours, and the dose is listed here. 0.25 to 2 grams per kg per dose, IV over 30 minutes to an hour. Pediatric patients may be administered um, the same dose, except um, you may give it 20 minutes to an hour. Consideration when administering mannitol is that you have to use an inline filter and avoid those with serum osmolality of more than 320 or osmolar gap of more than 20. Mannitol can be administered via central IV line or peripheral IV line, but is preferred using central IV line. Now we'll head into hypertonic saline. 3% hypertonic saline has been used to prevent brain injuries since the 1980s. Hypertonic saline is supplied as 3% to 23.4%. Side effects of administering the solution may include hypernatremia, osmotic demyelination syndrome, hypervolemia, and extravasation. Contraindications, there are none. However, you want to be cautious in patients who have chronic heart failure or renal insufficiency. When administering hypertonic saline, the onset is about five minutes and duration of action is about 12 hours. The onset is quicker than mannitol and the duration of, of action is more sustained. There are two dosing regimen, like we've mentioned in the guidelines, continuous infusion as well as intermittent bolus. For continuous infusion, it's hypertonic saline 3% intravenously, 30 to 50 mils per hour, for pediatric patients, it's 3% IV, 0.1 to 1 mL per kg per hour. 
For intermittent bolus dosing, it's hypertonic saline 23.4%, IV 30 mL administered over 2 to 10 minutes, hypertonic saline 7.5%, IV 2 mL per kg administered over 20 minutes, and then for pediatric patients, it's hypertonic saline 3%, IV 6.5 to 10 mL per kg per dose. And so when considering administering of hypertonic saline, you want to avoid those with severe hypernatremia or hyperchloremia because that can increase the risk of acute kidney injuries. And then we want to be cautious in those with serum osmolality of more than 340. Just like mannitol, you can administer this peripherally or central IV line, however it's preferred via the central IV line. For our hyperosmolar agents, we want to monitor the renal function closely due to the fact that there is an increased risk of acute kidney injuries. And so for those with sodium level of 155 to 160 and chloride level of 110 to 115, we want to monitor them very closely to ensure that they are not developing an AKI. For mannitol specifically, we want to monitor osmolar gap of less than 20. The guideline actually prefers the use of monitoring osmolar gap over serum osmolarity. And then for hypertonic saline, the changes in sodium should not exceed 12 milliequivalent per liter in a 24-hour period. And then the sodium goal, like we mentioned in the guideline, is going to be 145 to 155. In summary, due to increased morbidity and mortality of cerebral edema, it's important to administer these hyperosmolar therapies in a timely and safe manner. If you've ever get a chance to read the guideline, the recommendations are vague because the overall quality of literature is low. And so we need higher quality of research to guide clinicians on choosing um, one agent over the other, whether it's mannitol or hypertonic saline. Cerebral edema treatment and management um, as seen in the guidelines, are guided by underlying pathologies. For years, hyperosmotic treatments has been used in critical care management of cerebral edema and elevated ICP. Hypertonic saline and mantol seem to be effective in reducing these issues. And so evidence do suggest that hyperosmolar therapy may help in reducing increased intracranial pressure or cerebral edema in patients with cerebral hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, acute ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhages, or even hepatic encephalopathy. However, um, studies don't show any improvement in neurological outcomes when administering hyperosmotic therapy to um, patients with cerebral edema. Hypertonic saline seems to have a slight edge over mannitol in that it has a quicker, more robust, and sustained response. Hypertonic saline can also be used in those who have failed mannitol, but the other way around may not be true. And you don't have to worry about crystallization and filters. Mannitol does present potential risk of hematoma expansion in those with intracerebral hemorrhage, and it wasn't discussed in subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this may be due to the fact that it's contraindicated um, with those with active bleeding. And then corticosteroids may be useful in those reducing cerebral edema with bacterial meningitis. As pharmacists, here are some of the activities where we can intervene in multidisciplinary teams to assist in administering hypertonic solutions. And so we can emphasize therapeutic treatment goals such as ICP, CPP, and osmolar gaps. We can ensure appropriate administration techniques and dosages, including um, having the correct IV access, using the appropriate rate of infusion, um, administering the appropriate doses. For our labs, we want to make sure we have the necessities um, when administering hypertonic saline or mannitol, including sodium, chloride, potassium, and osmolality. We can also communicate risk and contraindications for our therapy regimen. Um, in this case, hypertonic saline, we want to avoid those with hypernatremia or are volume overloaded. Um, for mannitol, those who have active bleeding, we want to avoid administering that solution. And then we can also confirm potential drug interactions such as hypoosmotic fluids, LR and 
dextrose 5, which may counteract our hyperosmolar therapy. And then we also want to monitor the adverse reactions with the treatment based on the patient's specific factors. And then here are my references. Thank you.